The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be a world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? We can shut your lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. I talk to your boxes. <laughs> All right, we have some very special guests for everyone today. Um, yeah, award-winning creative writer and director of the film Wade in the Water, David Messvin, and co-founder of the SoFly Surf School and his executive producer, uh, Bay and Abraha. Guys, welcome to the lineup. Thank you so much for coming here today. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, everyone, on your end. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Excited to have the conversation. For sure. And and where are you guys calling in from? I guess we're videoing in today. I'm up in Ventura County. What, are you guys in LA? What, what's what's going on? Yeah, I'm based in Long Beach uh, and Bayin. Do you want to shout out your area? Yeah, I, I live in Westchester. It's just north of LAX or a, a little bit oh, east cool. of Playa del Rey. Beautiful, beautiful. And it's been, um, I'm not sure if you guys um, have been surfing lately or surfing through the winter. It's been pretty cold up here. But what about today? Did you guys get out in the water for yourselves or what's been going on? David? Hey, you want to take this one? I'll let you yeah, take yeah. this one, brother. <laughs> <laughs> David, David, we like to joke. He surfs uh, once a quarter. <laughs> but, <Hey. laughs> I, uh, Quality over quantity. I mean, no, you definitely, you it, definitely, <laughs> definitely. I, I wasn't able to get in the water today, but I, we, I surfed yesterday, actually close to where you are in, uh, in Santa Barbara oh, yeah, yeah. In, at Rincon. Yep. And uh, the water was oh, cool. kind of cold, but it wasn't, it wasn't too, too cold. I surfed in the middle of the day, so the sun was out. It was all right. That's not too bad. Yeah, I I don't, I might just be getting older. Like I used to really like put my, my wetsuit on and I'm like, here's my armor. I'm a cold water guy. And then now I'm like, oh man, like it's in my bones for the whole day. <laughs> if I don't like thaw out, but I I'm just giving myself a break this winter. I think it's been extra cold. Maybe. I feel your pain, man. But Bayon is out every day, man. Every <laughs> day. Guy I try my best. Me. Every I, day, which is amazing. I try. Much oh, respect. That's cool. Or, well, if you were at Rincon yesterday, Bay, and was, were you there for the Rincon Classic, or? Um, yeah, I was supporting a, two good friends of mine. One, um, Brandon Benjamin, and uh, another friend, mm. Jeff. His, his last name starts with a B. It's escaping me right now. But Brandon went really far in the men's open. He went to the finals. He won his first two heats, and so he went straight. That was awesome. But I was surfing at the point. That was an open area, and I honestly sure. just caught one wave. I, I, we were busy with our screenings, and I just wanted to <laughs> say hi to some friends. Just had one solid wave. It was like a little bit overhead. I was happy, and I got out. I was I was stoked. I love it. Well, on the the topic of screeners, you you guys you guys sent it to you know Miguel, our producer, and myself. So I had I had the good fortune to watch the film uh, Wade in the Water: A Journey into Black Surfing and Aquatic Culture. It is uh, stunning in, in a lot of ways. You know, it's got this incredible artwork um, by We Are Royale and and features appearances and insights from you know Salema Masakella and Josh Faulkner, Tony Corley, Dr. Kevin Johnson, Dr. Allison Rose Jefferson, Sharon Schaefer w with VO from Gigi Lucas. And it's just it's just a fantastic film, and, and I'm so excited to talk to you guys about it. And maybe, you know, David, for our listeners who haven't been introduced to the film, what's the general synopsis, if, if, if you can explain it? Sure, sure. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, Wade in the Water dives into, you know, the thousand years of history of surfing um, from the coast, from the west coast of Africa all the way through the Middle Passage to the Americas, looking at, you know, the Jim Crow era in Southern California, and particularly, like you said, Allison Jefferson, um, and then looking at the spiritual connection we as all surfers have, but through the lens of African Americans, looking at, you know, pioneers, you mentioned Tony Corley, uh, Nick Gabaldon, you know, Sharon, all these pioneers that have been around building our community, Black Surfers Collective, and through spirituality, and then eventually working our way to the future, looking really at the future, what it, what, what it means to be a Black Surfer. Um, and in many ways, this project for us, you know, for our community, Begin and myself, is really to inspire the next generation of Black Surfers by 
giving them this inspiration, this insight about surfing being part of our culture. Right. And, and, and that does kind of track, at least from the viewing experience of that feels like it's a huge inspiration to not so much course correct, but like educate, like, Hey, no, like like aquatic culture has been a part of black culture since the beginning. I mean, pretty much any, any community with a coastline have some relationship with the ocean, but it's something that probably systems that have been put on top of, you know, aquatic culture have actually erased a lot of that information. And this film does an awesome job kind of reestablishing like, no, this has been true since the beginning, you know, you know, Bayan, how did, how did you get involved in the film project? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so David actually reached out to me through an Instagram community um, that that's Black Dot Surfers, run by uh, Kaita Johnson, and he was actually one of the people in the water yesterday at Rincon that I was trying to kind of fellowship with before he kind of went back up to Northern California. But um, yeah, he he reached out through, to me through there, and I I was honored to be featured in the documentary and along with Softly Surf School. But I uh, I just thought it was such an amazing project. I just wanted to get more involved and help out anywhere I could. And so then I started, you know, coming to shoots, helping out. I think one of the first things I did for David is I got him an SD card from Staples. And so that's what really uh, kind of put my resume on the map. And then, um, yeah, from there, I think the, the big value that I was able to add to the project and help David out with was mostly introducing him to the younger generation of kind of the community, the black surfers, BIPOC surfers, all the organizations doing amazing work like Color the Water, you know, Intersection Surf. Um, there's so many, so many organizations, Ebony Beach Club doing amazing work in the community in the LA and San Diego area. And so that, that's really how I got involved. And then eventually David said, you need to have some kind of title on the project. And that's when I, I got into the executive producer role. Very cool. Like, like most great relationships, it starts with the supplying of an SD card. Is, is <laughs> exactly. <So> exactly. <laughs> you know, the, the film is so it, it's, it, it, it tackles such a large, uh, subject matter but it's structured pretty pretty well in the sense of you, you have these chapters you've got chapter one's origin chapter two's pioneers chapter three is challenges chapter four is spirituality and chapter five is future you know david when you were structuring the film it makes sense to kind of start at the beginning but you know we talk about this on this podcast all the time like for all the the siloing and 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 kind of the splitting up of people in surfing, whether it's around you know gender lines or racial lines or or you know ageism lines or whatever it is, sexuality lines, it is one of those things we talked about a little bit before. Like any community with a coastline, you're dealing with the ocean, and and you know we talk about this a lot. Like the ocean's the most alien environment on the planet for human beings, and surfing happens at probably the most violent part of that environment where the land meets the sea. And so really anyone agnostic of background, having that kind of experience in that space has like a shared experience that, that should actually generate more inclusion than exclusion, but that's not always the case. But I, I think the way you've kind of structured this film with origins as actually a great way to kind of set it up where it's like, you know, people in Africa have been going into the water and have been wave riding for centuries. Right, right. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. And the person I would love to give credit to in terms of the structure is our editor, uh, Tafari Saifu, who is from Ethiopia as well. And, you know, as we're working through it, we're going back and forth how to structure it. Do we tell the story backwards? Do we start the story with a thousand years? Mm. And he literally, you know, came up with this structure as we were brainstorming. And I was like, perfect, you nailed it. Let's go with it. And at one point, we actually <laughs> took it apart, went away from that, shared it. You know, we would share it with directors and editors, and they would give us feedback. And they were having a hard time, you know, with the story and continuity. Went right back to it, and it just brought it right back. So a lot of credit goes to him. That said, to your point about you know that it touches on different subject matter, that really came to be, you know because of how this project came to be. Uh, and the reason is my background, you know, just jumping a little bit, I know we're going to drive a little bit more about bios, but I think it will help in this sense. I'm, I'm an ad guy, I work in the advertising world, and it's through 
my experience through Black Lives Matter or leading up to Black Lives Matter that really led to this project because what was happening with me was uh, this link fate that I was having every time a person died through the hand of, you know, police officers. It just, I just felt like I was seeing myself dying every time and it just really hurt. And I have a child, you know, I have a 17 year old, I have a seven year old and my 17, who's a boy, he's about to start driving and I would see him in those moments. It's, it's just, you know, it's a thing that a lot of African-Americans go through as we see our brothers and sisters die. And after the death of George Floyd, I just felt like as a creative person, I had to let this energy out. You know, I needed a healing and the only way I could do it is by expressing myself through arts. And it really began with the idea of doing portraits. I think you see them in the background, these mm -hmm. portraits of Black Surfers Collective. And that's the group that I knew before. And what I wanted to do was take their portraits, sell their portraits, give them a percentage of the sale. And then it was, as I was doing the research, I came across the book uh, Afro Surf through Mami Wata and Salema Masekela. And I came through that code of Professor Kevin Dawson about the thousand year old history of surfing in, in Africa, of course, right? Of course, but you never made that connection. All these years I've been surfing, I've always felt like this wasn't part of my culture. This wasn't part of my community. But whenever I connected with Black Surfers Collective and a few of the Black Surfers that I knew, you know, I felt close, I felt connected. There was this human connection to nature, right? Mm -hmm. So in terms of the topics, really the topics came to be as I started asking these questions, I started, I had like general questions, but then again, my approach of the interviews was to ask a person a question and if there was something really interesting that they said, chase that and just go deeper and deeper and deeper. And, you know, person like Chris, you know, um, you know, he talks about purpose, you know, from, mm. from Trinidad. And we dug a little bit deeper about purpose, the purpose of life. You know, everyone needs to have purpose. Some people take them a long time to find that purpose of life. Chris Dennis, that is. And, mm. you know, you have Sierra who talks about mental health you know, how she was about to kill herself, you know, suicide. And this was an intimate conversation with her in a garage, you know, a friend had rented this garage for filming and we were in there and she was just telling me the story, how surfing and connecting to God saved her life. That's very powerful. You know, um, there's, you know, access, there is racism, segregation, I mean, it touches on so many things, but at the end of the day, it's really about healing and, and it's about activism. It's really not about documentary. And these are revelations that are coming to me. I was at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival and I was asked, would you consider yourself a documentarian or activist? Mm. And I really came to the conclusion at that point, it was about activism. And uh, the screening, at the end of the screening, we had a sold out screening at Santa Barbara, and I'd love to read the whole quote, but this lady, the last thing that she said was, this is very healing. So it goes back to that healing. Um, it was a beautiful quote that she just, you know, said, but that's how she ended it. And it is about healing. Yeah. And it's interesting too, right? The way that you've positioned that is you consider yourself an activist, but your activism in a lot of ways is actually just presenting information, you know, that people maybe didn't have access to before. And, and I think that goes a long way. Um, you know, in, in the, the second chapter pioneers, I won't ask you, David, to give too much away of the film because I want people to see That's it, true, but true. you focus very closely on the figure of Nick Gabaldon, you know, just at a high level, is that something that you decided on before you started the, the filming process or did you kind of discover that through all your conversations? So, yeah, so two things, two important people that informed me of Nick Gabaldon and the organization. The organization was Black Surfers Collective. In 2011, I went to attend that event and it was the Nick Gabaldon Day. I didn't know who Nick Gabaldon was. When I arrived, I found this booth with, you know, Allison Jefferson, 
kind of educating me, informing me of who Nick Gabaldon was. And I was just blown away the history, anyone that reads about and hears about Nick Gabaldon, you know, just, it was just mind blowing, right? And then the third person was Rick Blocker. You know, he's our historian and Rick kind of broke it down for me. And he's the one who really went back and discovered all of this and shared it with the community eloquently. Alison Jefferson does a really good job in her book, you know, telling us about him. And that's when I discovered Nick Gabaldon, 2011. So all this information about the Jim Crow era, uh, Nick Gabaldon, I've been hearing all this information, just soaking it, and it just finally came out, you know, um, this, you know, through this documentary. Right, right. And I mean, the film, it, it, it goes through chapter three, right, which is challenges. And it talks about how, you know, the city of Los Angeles used the concept of imminent donate, uh, excuse me, imminent domain to take black owned, African American owned properties. A few of the cases it cites are in the 1920s, you've got Bruce's Beach in, in Manhattan Beach, which was finally returned, you know, in, in 2021. But in the 1950s, you got La Bonita Resort in Santa Monica. You also have the Ebony Beach Club in Santa Monica. You know, Bayon, you know, for our listeners that might not know what that means, like, can you explain what the concept of eminent domain is and how it impacted these cases? Yeah, totally. So if I had to explain it on a high level, imminent domain is really, it's kind of a legal vehicle that that the government can really use to take control of some property, some, some actual geographical land. And in this case, you know, three different cases we go through in the documentary that I think people would find a lot of value from is just those three cases, they share that same legal vehicle that was that was kind of used. And actually in the speech that, that during the time it was given back, Bruce's Beach was given back one of those pieces of land, uh, it was actually said, like the, the person that gave it back said that, you know, the law was used to take this land. And now the law will be used to give it back. And so that's really that's really what eminent domain is. It's just a legal vehicle to kind of, you know, in a in a kosher way, kind of essentially steal steal land. And not in all cases, of course, in some cases, you know, eminent domain has legal kind of grounds and it has like a rational kind of logic behind it. But in the in these cases, it was it was pretty evident that you know, this, this vehicle was just used as a proxy and, and just as a, yeah, just as a proxy to kind of take this land, but there was no real kind of um, backing behind that. There was no reasoning that that really made a lot of sense. And that's why Bruce's Beach was actually given back. But yeah, we go through two other cases of that on the California coastline where, you know, black people, um, in, in all of the cases, we're starting these these beachside communities, either it's a bathhouse or a club or beach club, things like that. And they were just stifled because, you know, just certain people didn't want them to make progress in that in that front. And so, yeah, they, they were kind of imminent domain was used to, to kind of take that away from them. Right, right. You know, David, you, you talked a little bit about the spirituality component and then early in the film, there's a, a quote um, talking about, you know, the, the missionary impact on communities in Africa and, and you know, black communities that had a, a true connection to the ocean. But it said, you know, with the spread of Christianity, the Catholic Church discouraged swimming for moral reasons. And that kind of set off this ripple effect of like, oh, no, you got to cover up. You can't be out in the ocean. And of course, you know, like it's a huge eye roll for me at that point. I'm like, yeah, OK, of course, there's one more crap thing that's happened from, <laughs> from this institution. Um, but you guys dive into the, the spirituality component in a big way. And, and you know, Bayan, again, for the listeners, the, the figure of um, Mami Wata and, and, and what her significance is in surfing and, and black culture. Could you give us just a high level um, of, of that? Yeah, no, totally. Um, so yeah, Mami Wata is, uh, is an African water deity. And I think it dates back to Western Africa primarily. And it's just, mm -hmm. uh, it's just kind of a shape-shifting um, kind of a morphing kind of water deity that's not easy to to kind of define, but you know obviously it lives in the water space, and so you know ancient Africa, that was a very big you know, Mamiwata was it was someone or a deity that they would feel they, they would connect to when they would you know be swimming or fishing or doing any kind of water activities, and then how it connects to surfing is obviously surfing happens in the ocean, and I I, I don't know that we have. 
super specific connections between Mamiwata and African surfing, but we know that Mamiwata mm. was, you know, an African water deity. And we know that at the same time that that was a kind of a part of African history, there was also African surfing, accounts of African surfing. And so it's, it's pretty logical to kind of connect the two kind of ideas. And I think that was one of the drivers for uh, the brand Mamiwata to name their company after that kind of water deity, because you know, the whole, the whole, it makes a lot of sense just in water, spiritual connection, surfing. Um, so that's kind of a bit about Mami Watts. I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, it, well, it absolutely does. And I think it, it really shines a light on the point that you're both making in this opening segment, right? Which is that a huge inspiration for the film is to inform, you know, and, and to educate people on this connection, both kind of physical, mental, and, and spiritual between black communities in the ocean. And I think the figure of Mamiwata is, you know, these communities wouldn't even have a deity like that if they didn't have that connection. So I think it, it really drives that point home. You know, David, you know, we talked a little bit about it at the start, but, you know, how would you kind of describe your own spiritual connection to the ocean, um, both before and after making this film? Yeah, no. So before would be, you know, I, I, I grew up in Ethiopia. I, I left Ethiopia at a very young age. Um, I was 14 and I was adopted by a family, uh, Demetrius Kuchel and moved to St. Augustine, Florida, of all places. And when I arrived, I didn't know how to swim. Um, I didn't speak a lick of English. I had to learn all of it during the summer. And my first experience was at the YMCA, you know, just learning how to swim. And I was the only black kid. I was probably the tallest, biggest kid. <laughs> Everyone else was like these little kids <laughs> swimming around. And I learned how to swim. And there was a, there was a guy, the, the lifeguard was uh, from South America and we really connected and he's like, man, you should start surfing. We went out you know, I surfed the first time and I really fell in love and I fell in love going back to your question for multiple reasons. You know, when I arrived here, I really didn't have my family with me. It just felt like, you know, this is a whole new culture. This is a whole new community. There's a whole new family, but nature and mother ocean just felt at home. You know, it's just like I always say, the ocean has been my refuge, you know, so that spiritual connection really started there. There's something about the ocean, just like any surfer can connect with the ocean. If you let yourself, there's a deeper connection to the ocean that is just an amazing thing to have. You know, if you don't know how to surf or you're thinking about learning how to surf, it's more than surfing, right? We know it as surfers, the stoke, you know, we talk about it. And that was really the early connection to mother ocean and then going back to your question about current day of course you know with black life what matters and what happened and me trying to find a reason of what's happening in our world you know um trying to express this pain that i had i had to go back to the ocean the place that would heal me you know the place that i know spiritually exists and I knew it existed in every surfer as well that I would interview. So it was very important to me to ask individuals about like, do you have a spiritual connection? And that's really what that section is. You hear from different people about their connection to the ocean and it varies. And one pattern that we saw for Bayin and I with Bayin and I was that a few people talked about that baptism, you know, when you mm -hmm. go in that water, it's baptism, it's a cleansing. And when you watch the documentary, the opening documentary, it's very much about reconnecting to Mother Ocean and Mami Wata. And that opening animation by We Are Royale is really the moment a surfer duck dives. In my opinion, that's when you lose your consciousness and you connect to Mother Ocean. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that speaks to that shared experience you know the film it closes with this beautiful poem by siku andrews um and a part of it reads and if you'll humor me for a moment um we move like poetry in the ocean for we are the original bodies of water just as much body in the ocean as we are ocean in the body composed of one part flesh two parts water and three part harmony a body a wave 
and a blade are all you need to see the world. So come find me where motherland meets mother sea. Let this tide carry us home on wood, polyurethane, and soft top foam. We are made in the water, birthed from a pregnant motherland each time her water point breaks. We are saved in the water, baptized by the waves, but never capsized by the wakes. We are spayed in the water, kings and queens of an ocean that has always bet on black. We are raids in the water. We each take to the water and take the water back. We are swayed to the water like shore calls the sea. We are slaves to the water, the only place we feel free. We are home in the water. We have its DNA. It has our trust. So make no mistake, it is the water that wades in us. Um, I, I, hopefully we can dub it over with the actual <laughs> reading. <laughs> the day I did my best. The remix. Um, the remix. But, yeah. That um, was great. Be- beautifully written, you know. Um, yeah, uh, David, just, just, the actual poem for this film. Give us a little bit of background as to how that came about, because it is, it, it feels so perfectly made for the film you made. I know we were, we were trying to find an ending for it, and mm. there are so many different endings, and the credit really truly goes back to you know California music. Uh, this is two guys from Germany that we met at the Patagonia screening. We were doing sneak peek and, you know, they came after the screening and they said, you know, this is really great, but really we would love to help you with the music. And, you know, both of them served first. One of them actually lived in Ethiopia. So we just had this, this connection from the beginning and we started mm-hmm. brainstorming, you know, the different type of music, like the opening, what would that be, you know? Uh, when we get to the history part, how can we touch about African American, um, you know, music, you know, music that comes from the African American community? And the other thing that we made sure was when we got involved in the music and poetry that we worked with, and with an industry, you know, it's coming from African American artists, you know. So it was very important to have a poet and a perspective from the African-American community. So the way that poem came to be was, you know, they had worked with him. He's a, he's an Academy Award winning, you know, poet and musician. Incredible. And and so yeah. when they approached me saying, would you be interested? I'm like, of course, because we had just <laughs> finished, you know, the intro poem. And then you have the middle of it with the poem from Nick Gabaldon. It just made sense to end with poetry. And I basically, you know, jotted down my thoughts, my ideas on the poetry and shared it with them and they shared it with them. And there was a few other people that got involved. Some of his students got involved and everyone worked on it. I was actually in Ethiopia with my family and the poem was written once, was sent to me. I didn't change a thing, did not have a comment. It just touched my soul. And, and then when he read it, it was so powerful. So powerful. And, and you know, um, I, I think we're going to start giving things away, but the <laughs> footage that goes with it, you know, we ended up using um, a very slow motion camera, a phantom. You know, we had a friend that came in and shot with phantom. And to me, it was like that was a moment just let the phantom camera work. You know, these amazing surfing footage that we, we capture of CD and Andre uh, and, you know, Angel. Um, it just all came together. And I keep going back, you know, there's like this spiritual, ancestral spirit around this project. Like the co director came to be. Yeah, it's just, it just, they just came to be. So, uh, yeah, I'm grateful. To him, I'm grateful to California Music and how all this came to be. And, and yeah, just well, Dave, I, if, I, if I, I go on, band, if yeah, I could, if I could just add one thing that uh, at our premiere screening, Saron, which is Kaita's wife, is what she told me is she really enjoyed the different art forms that we kind of tried to weave together. Like David mentioned, the slow motion video with the with the poetry, and then we have some other visual effects. Like David said, we don't want to give away too much, but I think that was a common thing that we we not only that we tried to do intentionally, but it was really cool to see that validation, that kind of confirmation that people kind of appreciated that. So that was a big goal for us 
I, I love it. And, and I was going to say, I don't want to put you guys on the spot to reveal any more of the film, but we can talk about, you know, the screening events. By the time this episode airs, you will have just completed the second largest event this month, the Pan-African Film Festival on February 18th. And when th this episode, our, our podcast airs, the next event will be actually tomorrow for listeners listening to this. It'll be you know, February 22nd at Patagonia in Santa Monica from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. You know, David, you've, you've had a couple of events, you know, specifically with, with these events coming up and the one at Patagonia in Santa Monica. What can, what can viewers expect at, from the event? Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, hopefully, you know, you've, when you watch this, you, you were at the Pan-African Film Festival. I think that's one of the most important film festivals for us. We released this movie in Nigeria. You know, there was an intention to that, that a thousand years back, surfing started in Africa, and we wanted to make sure it was released in Africa where it started. And Pan-Africa is the same. It's reconnecting to our community here in the America, and it's the best platform that you can be at when your goal is to inspire the next generation of black surfers. That is our mm -hmm. community. That's the community that we want to reach and inspire and bring to the water. So really the, the, the goal for this is to specifically do that, but at the same time, for those of you who are coming to Patagonia and the other from festival, it's important to understand our history and to understand this is part of our culture is to embrace, to unite and to be one with Mother Ocean. And I think that is important for just in general for, you know, our surf community. So those are the two messages I really want to get across. Awesome. And then we have showings on the 23rd at San Diego State University. You guys are at the uh, Sofia Art Film Festival in Bulgaria in March, the Mannheim Art and Film Festival in Germany. You know, Bayan, for, for people that either want to travel to these festivals and check it out or might be local, like where can they get information to RSVP and, and, and watch the film? Yeah, the other two and really all the events that we have kind of going, you can find them on our website at uh, www.wadeinthewaterproject.com. Um, we have an events page and, you know, all the most relevant, most latest and greatest kind of links and information is really there. And those those are subjects that change, you know, as, as we get more information, we kind of post it there. So that's really the, the kind of the Bible as far as events go for us. But if you want to just keep up to date just in general with new events and just new information, you can also sign up on a, through a mailing list or sign up for a mailing list through the website. Um, and then you can also follow us on Instagram at David Mesfin Art. Uh, where we post all, those those two kind of streams are where we post you know the latest information and especially events the website would be the best place perfect and we will include a link in the episode description for everyone that wants to RSVP, but make sure you go check out the screening tomorrow on February 22nd at Patagonia in Santa Monica from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. or Thursday on the 23rd at San Diego State University from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. We're going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors and we'll be right back. All right. So once again, for everyone listening, be sure to check out Wade in the Water. It is screening tomorrow, February 22nd at Patagonia in Santa Monica with huge support from Surfrider LA. And then again on Thursday, the 23rd at San Diego State University. We're here with David Mesvin and Bayan Abraha. Um, guys, thank you so much for that opening segment and diving into the film. It is a beautiful film to watch. I can't wait for everyone to see it. But uh, a little bit more about both of you, you know, Bayan, maybe starting with you, you know, yeah. what's your background? Where do you come from originally? What was early life like? Mom, dad, siblings? Where'd you come from? Yeah, totally. So, um, yeah, I was born in Ethiopia in Addis Ababa, the same place as David, um, but I'm actually Eritrean. And one cool thing about this project, Eritrea and Ethiopia have a very troubled past. And uh, we actually used to be, we had a civil war pretty recently, mm -hmm. but it's really cool that David and I can kind of come together and work on this project without any, any hiccups, really. Um, so I was born there. I moved to Toronto two years old uh, my dad sponsored my mom and she came over um, i have a sister a younger sister she was born shortly maybe a year after that um, she's three years younger than me so grew up over there growing up didn't even you know landlocked didn't think about 
surfing at all. Didn't even, I, I talk about it now. I don't even think, I don't remember having even a thought about surfing. I don't remember seeing a surfer, nothing like that at all. And so the only, the only time I got introduced to that is, well, first I went to school. I went to engineering school in Canada and I kind of got my engineering degree in mechanical engineering. And then I came to the Bay area for an internship, two internships. The first time I came, I uh, didn't, it was four months, didn't even think about surfing. I might have saw it here and there, but I never, no, nothing I tried or nothing I was interested in yet. Um, the second time I came came back, uh, my co-intern, the, the person that was in the same position as me, he lived in a van. Um, his name was Walker and he lived in a van and he surfed Santa Cruz all the time. And I was just amazed. I was like, there's no way, like I was asking him questions every day. And so then I got really interested in this idea of surfing. Um, I skated a little bit when I was younger. I skied, snowboarded, but... I, I just never got around to being by the ocean where I had the opportunity to surf. Um, then my roommate actually, who grew up in California, his name was Calvin, Calvin Pang. He, uh, he kind of took us out, all the Canadian interns, about 10 of us, he took us out surfing in Santa Cruz. And I, I have to say it wasn't the best introduction because it was about like five to six feet. We were out there with like 10 foot boards, nine foot boards. We were just mostly being like dangerous to other surfers. But you know, I saw, I had the experience. I got out there, I saw, surfer surfing and I was like that looks really really great um, I, I think I might have caught a wave on my stomach maybe bodyboarded a wave and I think I might have felt the energy of the wave but I never I, I never really caught the bug at that moment but I knew I wanted to do it again um, most of the friends I did it with they had really dangerous experiences they none of them maybe one of them really stuck with it two of them maybe stuck with it but the rest had no interest anymore um, so I tried it again got my own kind of rental and I, I remember I caught a wave at Cowell State Beach in Santa Cruz and I was on the face I was pumping and I, I just got this feeling and I was like, there's no way that you can just do this again and again. And that's when I really got that got, got that bug that I think most surfers can kind of relate to. And yeah, so I, quickly after that, I bought my own board, my own wetsuit. And I think within two weeks, I was going like four or five times a week, waking up at 4 a.m. to go before work, drive an hour to Santa Cruz, drive an hour back and get back into the office. And I was sleeping by 9 p.m., even though it was like, maybe 100 to 300 interns that were living in this like four block radius little complex. It was a really fun time, but I wasn't really going out with people. I was like, I got to sleep. The surf is going to be good tomorrow. I can't, I can't miss that. And so that's kind of how I got into surfing. Um, went back to school in Canada, finished my, my schooling, came out to LA. That was my goal to kind of move down here so I can have more access to the coastline without driving so far. And so, yeah, I moved to Dana Point. And uh, obviously, as you know, that's a great surfing location right north of San Clemente, some of the best waves in the world, definitely in the United States. And so I, I was, you know, I was longboarding a lot. I surfed Doheny State Beach a lot. Then once I got a little bit more comfortable, I surfed San O and, you know, churches, even got around to surfing like lowers and uppers and all the kind of trestles breaks. Um, then I, I started to travel a lot more. I wanted to, you know, explore mo more of the coastline. I think San Diego, North County, San Diego, especially is some of my favorite waves, a very wave rich kind of area. Um, wh breaks like Grandview, Pipes, um, Swami, some of my favorite breaks. And then LA, you know, once the summertime rolled around, I, I really got into kind of Malibu and Topanga and Leo Carrillo and all the kind of North LA breaks. Um, and so, yeah, now I live in Westchester after kind of COVID subsided, I had to kind of come back into the office three days a week and my office is in Culver City. And so I moved to Westchester and now I serve El Porto. It's just 12 minutes down the road. And so it's not the best break in the world, but it's, it's usually breaking. And yeah, I'm getting more into kind of mid length and short board waves and it's been fun. So yeah, that's a little bit about my background. Um, other than that, you know, I like to travel. All, all the trips I've taken really since I've started surfing have been for surfing. Uh, maybe like 90% of them have been to surf locations so I could surf. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about myself. I don't know if you had anything specific you wanted to ask. I, I, no, no, no. I thought that was that was perfect. I love, I love. You know, it, it's something that comes up in these podcasts a lot, where you know, surfing it's it's a temporal thing. Like you're out there and you're riding a wave and then it's gone. It's not like rock climbing where you can go back and you're like, I'm looking at that same rock that I went up and I remember it. It's it's a lot of surfers are like, I can't remember the wave. I know it was a really good one, but it's it's gone now. But that first wave, you know, like the one at Cowles where you're like the first face wave really makes an impression on people where people are like, I remember what life was like before that wave. Totally. And then after that wave, totally. it was a big deal. It was a 100%. Big deal. You know, and and David, you you talked about a little bit about your experience, um, you know, coming from Ethiopia, but growing up in in Florida. Um, 
you know, in terms of, you know, going from learning how to swim to going out in the ocean and, and having that, that swim instructor from South America, you know, what were those first surfing experiences like for you and, and where did you surf? Right, right. So I surfed in St. Augustine, Florida. There was an area called A Street. That was like where everyone went out surfing. It was a local spot. A lot, a lot of, uh, of, uh, the amazing surfers in St. Augustine come from that. I lived further north of St. Augustine uh, or A Street, and it was called the Holiday Inn break. There was a Holiday Inn right <laughs> next to where I lived, so it was called the Holiday Inn break. And, you know, <laughs> I have to admit, there was a bit of localism in me <laughs> trying to own that territory right there. So I have to be honest with people. It is a thing when you're a surfer. And uh, the thing we used to do, you know, I had like all these buddies that I used to surf with. And, you know, summertime, San Augustine gets really, really hot. And, you know, you have all these tourists that come out and swim in the water. And uh, <laughs> I used to have these friends that used to scream shark. <laughs> everyone was just clear uh you know being a kid you know these crazy you do these crazy things and everyone would, would clear out so i still have these friends in san augustine we sign off every time we write to each other <laughs> you know by the just shark you know and we know what it means it's just clearing so just just being honest of who i am and my personality but yeah those days in in san augustine the thing, what was interesting about San Augustine was the history, you know, <clears throat> there was so much history. It's, it's a town, you know, where Ponce de Leon came from Spain. It was a Spanish territory. There was Fort Mose, which was the first actually fort that African-Americans can come, you know, enslaved African-Americans can come and be free. Um, if you were able to make it to the Spanish territory from Georgia, any part of the country using lakes and rivers and ocean and again this goes back to the history of the aquatic culture a lot of them escape through rivers and oceans and if you ever get a chance to go to san augustine what you'll see is there's a boat replica of what type of boat african-americans used to escape and there you know the african-american history kind of begins you know they the history in san augustine begins with freedom up north right so the only requirement was that you become Catholic, going back to Catholicism, as we started this conversation. Once you became Catholic, you were free, you know, to have a shop, roam around and so forth. Of course, that changed once, you know, uh, Florida became part of the America and, you know, uh, the civil rights, prior to civil rights movement, you know, the, the, the slavery and, and everything continues. It has a pretty dark history. But then again, you know, what was interesting about St. Augustine aquatic culture, of course, was the civil rights movement. The passage of 1964 civil rights movement took or began in St. Augustine. And that whole thing became, became to be from the beach, Frank Butler Beach. Frank Butler was an African-American that owned a beach in St. Augustine. And this was a place where African Americans can go out and recreate, you know, recre you know, for recreations, all kinds of purposes. And that's where really this tension between African Americans and, you know, the whites in St. Augustine began. There's a video out there if you ever want to watch it, where, you know, there's beatings, you know, police officers came in trying to break it up. But then again, there's a lot of beatings between the communities. And even, you know, Martin Luther King tried to stay in one of the homes of Frank Butler, if you ever make it there, I took a picture of it where someone came in there and shot through the bullet and it's right on the beach. So mm. this idea of quarter culture and African American St. Augustine was kind of instilled in me at even the Monsoon Lodge where, you know, a gentleman, the owner of the motel ended up, you know, uh, throwing bleach into the water. It's actually more than bleach. Mm and you know, trying to get rid of the African-Americans that were going in the water. And it wasn't really Af just African-Americans. If you look at that picture, there are you know, activists and whites and a lot of you know, uh, Jewish individuals that were involved in 
helping the African Americans and passing the civil rights movement. Um, and so aquatic culture, surfing, my experience of surfing is, more, is far more than connecting with Mother Ocean. It's really understanding activism and what it takes to change and have impact in our society in ways of healing. You know, Mother Ocean has a way of healing us and we have to be activists. And this film is very much, you know, a, a reflection of my experience. It's interesting to hear you talk about that because, you know, for so many surfers, myself included, and I'd imagine for both of you on some level as well, like one of the appealing characteristics of the activity is, oh, this is escapism for me. I'm able to disconnect and it's a meditation and, you know, I don't want to think about life on the beach. I don't want to think about whatever issues are going on, you know, in, in my life. I, I, I just want to focus on this one thing. But that really is also coming from a place of pretty radical privilege because for a lot of people, I mean, yourselves included, I would imagine just hearing you talk about it is you don't have that privilege all the time. Like, you know, the, the racial history is sort of imbued in the experience of going into the water in a lot of these locations. And it just feels like it's always front of mind for both of you. Is that, is that fair? Maybe Bayon and then David answer. Um, I, I would say I, I definitely, I'm very aware of, of that kind of concept. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a good place to start, but for me personally, I don't like focusing on kind of negativity and especially the past negativity in the past. Like I'm much more kind of action oriented and future looking. And so I, I try to put a lot of my energy into, you know, making change and getting involved to try to use my own time and effort, my own energy to make change to kind of solve some of those problems or contribute to, towards solving mm -hmm. some of those problems. And so I wouldn't say I'm constantly think of it, thinking about it at all. I mean, there are things that remind me of it, you know, when I see some really sad stories on the news, police brutality, or, mm -hmm. you know, when I hear about a friend that has a terrible altercation in the water or, you know, when people share some experiences, things like that, it definitely comes, it kind of, all those things kind of rush back. But I just try, I don't like to focus on them because I think it's really, kind of crippling it can be really crippling and and just like debilitating and so I, I, I try to keep my mind positive and focus on what I do in the moment to kind of make change that's my point of view what about you David yeah this is where we kind of <laughs> <laughs> split um for me the past is important you know there is a famous director Haile Garima there's a documentary called um, so it's not even a documentary, it's actually a feature film that I saw years back, uh, Sankofa, and Sankofa is this symbol, this Adinkira symbol from Ghana. And what that teaches us is that we have to look to our past to move forward. And that's really important to me, um, you know, having been exposed to, you know, to that symbolism and what it is to be African and African-American. And I think the other thing is, you know, you learn things through these um, heartaches and pains that, you know, African-Americans have gone through and, you know, we're going through together, you know, as as immigrants coming in. Um, even recently, you know, we were screening at Patagonia. It was a sneak peek and and, you know, it was just we were two guys working on this project, but it was really important to hear what it is to be a, a woman, what it is to be African-American woman. And Lizelle Jackson, who's the founder of Call of the Water, when she talked about, you know, what it is to be a black woman and to approach the ocean, the beach, that you can't really do it on your own. You know, you have to kind of have your posse, you know, going back to localism, things that I've actually been part of, and also just understanding surf culture and, and that is part of what we're talking about. You know, these things still exist. You know, there are a lot of people that are still having a hard time, you know, uh, accessing the beach or dealing with the beach community, dealing with the culture of surfing. So being an African-American, it's a whole different layer. And it's something that we really need to talk about and discuss not only amongst us as African-Americans, we really discuss it with the larger community, the surf community, because at the end, it will heal all of us and make us 
better people. So it's important to me. Well, you and Bayan having slightly different approaches to that makes sense in the sense of, you know, um, Aaron Sorkin, the writer, once said, he goes, if you want the best possible content, you got to get the smartest people you can find that have different opinions um, <laughs> in the same room to work together. So exactly. it makes sense that you guys exactly. produce something so so impactful. You know, David, uh, you know, you've worked on tons of projects and, and brands from, you know, Super Bowl ads like FIFA, NFL, Sony, Adidas, Oakley, Toyota. It, it goes on and on and on. In your in your sort of day job life, how how is working on Wade in the Water different from these other projects for you, if at all? I'm, I'm sure maybe some of the motivations were different, but were there things that you pulled from your professional life into this project that that made it work for you? No, definitely. I mean, I have to give credit to anyone and everyone. You know, my mentors, my teachers that really showed me the ropes, you know, people that I've worked with in the industry, people in post-production houses, even, you know, to finish this project, you know, the Dan, I know Company 3 reached out, uh, uh, California Music, um, you know, We Are Real Real. was actually a company that I worked with. So, you know, it's all of this, the, the advertising and design community has enriched me and given me so much opportunity to be part, you know, of Super Bowl, FIFA and so forth. So a lot of credit goes to, you know, the current company that I work for, you know, just plugging names now <laughs> in Ocean USA <laughs> or in Ocean Worldwide. You know, Steve June is the CEO of the company. And, you know, I was like halfway through this project and I'm like, I have to tell him I'm working on a documentary. And I shared it with HR and HR shared it with Steve and Steve was like so supportive. Uh, my, you know, ECD was the executive creative director, you know, Barney. So everyone has been really supportive. You know, anytime I post something, they're liking it and just giving us props to move forward. So, yes, you know, the difference between the two is this is a passion project, you know. Um, you have your day job, you know, it pays the bill and you're working with a collective group of people. You have a client that has a vision and, and an audience that you want to reach. And that's quite diff- a different path because it's kind of like your baby. <laughs> you know, the creativity is, 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 is something that, you know, you have to have a thick skin for and you're able to take criticism and go reach in every way it goes based on feedbacks and 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 directions it goes but when it came to this one i really wanted the freedom because it was such a special project it was historical and it dealt with pain it dealt with a community that i love you know the black surface collective and all the surface that i know it felt with issues that i dealt with it felt with what was happening to me and my kids you know as they were asking me why are they killing us you know so it was a completely different experience of a process of healing in this particular case. Of course. And yeah. I mean, you're both so busy, you know, and in addition to everything you're doing, David, you're also a mentor at the One School and in 4A's foundation, um, you know, multicultural advertising intern program. And, and Bayin, you, you co-founded Softly Surf School you, can you tell the listeners a little bit about what that is, what you do for the school and, and, and how it got started? Yeah, totally. Um, so Softly Surf School, we are an up and coming kind of new surf school. We started a year, year and a half ago. And we, we, we started really through the founder, Sa, Sa Philly Maturi. He, uh, you know, he always had this dream. He's been surfing for about 15 years. He's a little bit older. And he, uh, he always had this dream of kind of starting a surf school and passing on this, this beautiful sport of surfing to, to people of color that look like him and his Long Beach community. And so, you know, he had a very tough time starting out. He didn't see anyone that really looked like him, like Salema Masakela was someone he saw on TV. And mm. he was always really kind of inspired by that. But no one he could kind of relate to in his daily life. But still, you know, just the stoke and just the interest in the sport really drove him, drove him to kind of improve. And today he's one of the best surfers that I know. He's an incredible surfer. You know, he can he, he knows how to find a barrel. He, he makes really good turns. He can longboard. He's a really great surfer. And so he started it with um, with a, his cousin or his kind of pseudo cousin, Ashley Dawkins, 
which uh, she asked him if she he could teach her and her friends how to surf. And, you know, he, he took that opportunity very seriously. He kind of laid out all the boards really professionally. He got them wetsuits and they didn't have to deal with, they didn't have to worry about anything. And they kind of asked her like, hey, your cousin is like really professional. Is this like a surf school that he has or something like that? And then just jokingly, Ashley and Saw, they said like, we should start something like softly surf school maybe. And then that moment just clicked and that's when the whole kind of thing started and i was still in canada actually at the time but i I saw the social media stuff happening i was already connected with saw again through the black dot surfers community and so i reached out to him you know really early on i think the first event he did i reached out to him and i was like hey i I would really like to help when i get to la and he said yeah we need all the help we can get like when you get here send me a message and just started helping out just again going to events you know bringing any boards i had um, trying to reach out to people in the community organize instruction um and it was kind of crazy to me like the fact that i just started surfing maybe two three years before that but i, I would i had now i'm i was contemplating teaching other people how to surf and so that was something that i had to think about a little bit but i, I realized that i was really kind of passionate about that and yeah, ever since then, we've been really shaking and moving. And especially this last summer, we've been ha- we've had a lot of lot of success, a lot of growth. Um, you know, we only we almost have 3000 Instagram followers, which is a really big kind of milestone for us. Um, we, we had a great partnership with Ebony Beach Club, which throws these amazing beach parties at Dockweiler State Beach through a uh, brick brick and Gage Chrisman. They're really the founders of this this kind of organization. And they invited us to teach lessons at these beach parties. And so actually brick has an old school El Camino with an open bed in the back and he pulls that up to the beach and he puts his DJ equipment on top of it and he DJs from the back of the El Camino and that's I just think that I just thought that was an incredible incredible kind of scene and he puts a kind of a surfboard on the on the truck that has these uh, Basquiat inspired like African paintings by Alan Boris and so you know when people are you know his idea is really cool idea is kind of putting the medicine in the candy and his so, so what he's trying to do is trying to draw people to the beach th- through music, through through you know party, and through this this kind of creating a vibe, creating an environment for people that is very attractive, and then just you know sprinkling some little some little kind of hints of surfing and African surf culture, and then you know we have a surf school there present, free surf lessons you have access to. So even if you don't take a lesson, you see people that look like you surfing and being interested in it, and then so that was something that we were really blessed to be part of with Color of the Water, David Milana, and Lizelle Jack accent like David mentioned but um but yeah so this last summer we really went much further than we would ever really have hoped we got a big kind of u-haul truck donated to us and we're tuning it up and we're trying to get it on the road that's a big deal um and so yeah we're just marching forward we have a lot of big plans and yeah I'm just super excited and really thankful that I'm part of all of that and that's a huge kind of passion for me and thankfully this project a lot of the work happened through the the winter and it wasn't really during Mm. the surf school kind of active season but um yeah through the summer the the surf school is a big focus for me for sure that's very cool we're going to take uh one more quick break to get a word in from our sponsors and we'll be right back so guys when we're talking about weight in the water you know you you both have you know your own skill set you're bringing to to the film to bring it to life you know bay and you mentioned that you're patched into kind of the contemporary generation of, of black surfers, you know, who are some of the people that, that you're close to, you know, what are their roles in the surfing world right now? And, and how do you see that increasing as time goes on? Yeah, that's a good question, but um, it's a very difficult question. You're, you're putting me on the spot. I want to, first of all, apologize <laughs> if I miss anyone or if I didn't, if I misrepresent anyone for, for, for the first part, but yeah, I think the big people that I, I just speaking from experience, you know, just through my own kind of path, uh, I met Kaita Johnson really on, early on in my kind of surfing career in Northern California in my first really few months of surfing. Actually, my barber, he used to cut his hair as well. And he said, oh, I know another black surfer that I cut his hair to. I have to introduce you. And so I was really lucky to meet someone like him that he he runs this Instagram community, Black Dot Surfers, which now has upwards of 10,000 followers. And he even organized like a Discord community that has upwards of 500 surfers that, you know, is geo kind of organized. You can find surfers in different locations. You can talk about different topics inside of surfing, like beginner surfing, um, you know, intermediate, longboard, shortboard, whatever. And so he was someone that I really met a lot of people through uh, and I connected with, especially the Northern California community up there. And then when I really came down south, um, I would say the big people I, I, I kind of connected with that 
really opened me up to the rest of the community. I think people like Lizelle Jackson and David Milano that run Color of the Water, they have a huge kind of community of people of color surfing. Um, I think they have more than a thousand members and very active. They're always surfing every weekend, almost every day they teach lessons. And so those were really great people for me to meet. Um, Rissa is, uh, I, I don't, I forgot her last name, Rissa. I, d I don't know her last name right now, but uh, she is the, the founder and the executive director of Paddle for Peace. And she is someone that's extremely well connected down in San Diego. And she throws this great kind of Juneteenth event, which I've met a lot of, lot of people through. The first event that she threw, um, Kaita Johnson came down from Northern California, and that was really a huge gathering. David Milano was there, Lizelle Jackson. And that was a huge gathering of community leaders, community members. Um, and I, I would say I've met a lot of people through that. And then other people I, I, I would I would like to kind of highlight um, Mario and Kat, as well as uh, Lex Weinstein. Mario and Kat, they run an organization called Un Mar de Colores and Lex Weinstein, she runs an orga organization called Sea and Soil. And they do a lot of active, active work in uh, North County, San Diego. And again, they're just really well connected in the, in the community. And I started taking part in Sea and Soil and I, I really met a lot of people through that community. It was a really awesome weekly volunteer opportunity at like a local farm where we would just go and kind of, you know, work the ground, pick flower, pick, pick vegetables and whatever, and just organize them. And it would be for a donation. And so through that, I, I really met a lot of great people as well. Um, so yeah, I would say those are really the, the big kind of people. I would say the Black Surfers Collective, people like um, Greg and Marie Rochelle, uh, Rick Blocker, also very well connected in the community. And I met a lot of the older generation kind of through them because, you know, they started a, a few years back. Um, so that's what I would say as far as the people that have really been very, very um, powerful, very, very kind of useful to me in terms of connecting me with other community members and letting me kind of, you know, bring those people onto the project and, and help David out. Right. And, you know, you know, fostering that kind of, you know, positive impact on a community is often a, both a top down and a bottoms up approach. You know, the bottoms up is creating the, the mechanisms and the platforms for people to feel included and welcome and learn. But then from a top down perspective, you know, there's been surfers, you mentioned Chris Dennis is a, he's a world-class surfer, but you know, there's more and more surfers being represented by, I say, I guess what we would call the traditional surf industry, whether it's, you know, Josh Faulkner, Sherry Fall, Hunter Jones, you know, Chelsea Woody from Santa Cruz, you know, David, what is your view on, you know, the, the surf brands and their support of BIPOC surfers, um, Probably, I guess, two questions. How has it changed in your lifetime and, and where do you see it going from, from today into the future? Right. I think, you know, in terms of the change for me, it began with Black Surfers Collective. So uh, my, my perspective has always been through starting with our community, right? So the top down would be like you said, like Chris Dennis really taking on his own and looking at, you know, mental health and how he can heal his community. Black Surfers Collective, you know, reaching out to the community, to the BIPOC community, Tony Corley, you reaching out and asking African-Americans if you're out there, come be part of my community. Lizelle, Jessa focusing on just women, you know, you have, you know, Brick, as Bayan talked about, reaching out to the youth and really turning this into a celebration, you know, taking this pain of Ebony Beach Club and turning it into something really positive that's really powerful. So for me, what attracts me is us telling our stories. And that quote comes from Rick Blocker, you know, who said that we need to tell our stories through our lens. And he's been doing this for years and years. A lot of the footage that you see in there is, you know, from, from, from him. But then again, the bottom up to your point, I think, you know, we're part of the surfing community and it's important for us to be part of that community and that community to also respect our history and heritage and culture and to do that you really have to work with the community and that's why we it was important to us to reach out to the community and have some of these organizations even you know in some cases our organizations that you had surfers that work there like recently we had a company called 
at Folio that ended up sponsoring a, a, our actual party. And the owner, his wife, like they all surf. So they, they connected with us and you have come, you know, World Surf League, for example, you know, Sharon introduced us to Tim and Emily and them, you know, reaching, willing to help us. So yeah. I think when you look at organizations and companies, you know, even Meta ended up helping us. But these are organizations that have, you know, their own personal, you know, equity and inclusion department, which is in question right now, again, right? And these mm -hmm. are um, organiz you know, these are individuals that are within companies that end up helping stories like ours get out. So it's important that we keep them and cherish them and, and, and work with them. Um, so we've been lucky. And one of the biggest, biggest organizations that's been really supportive with this project, of course, is Patagonia. And Patagonia, from the first time that we asked, you know, we were introduced to Patagonia by a friend of ours, Michael Warner, up in uh, Santa Barbara. And Corey and him introduced us. Every door has opened for us at Patagonia. And even recently, when we were at you know Santa Barbara International Film Festival, Yvonne and Melinda and family and friends from Patagonia came to screen it. We had a follow up email. We also had a follow up from their you know equity and inclusion uh, you know global justice department asking us what else we can do to help you. So it's really looking at it like you said from top down, bottom up. But for me, top down is really starting with our community. Makes sense. It makes sense. Well, on the topic of community, we, we did put a feeler out for some questions from uh, folks that follow us on social media at the lineup pod. And we got a bunch of questions back, but we've we've whittled it down to to three. So, you know, for the purposes of, of this segment, um, I'll ask the question and then maybe just Bay and you answer, then David, you answer. And then we'll just kind of go through these three questions in, in that fashion. The, the first one is from at Kitty Kendall, who asks, uh, what's been your favorite part of working on Wade in the Water and, and why? So, so Bayan, why don't you start? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm always a big community guy. Like I love kind of connections in the community. I love community, community coming together, strengthening. And I think my favorite parts have been just at the events, just watching the, the connection that happens, you know, when people meet each other, they're so thankful to, to meet these people that they can relate with. Um, you know, they plan, you know, they go and do their own surf groups and they invite me or they don't invite me. I, I'm stoked either way because they're, they're kind of doing their thing and they're connecting with with just other surfers that look like them. And so I think for me, the big thing is community. I think my favorite part of this project has been just the community building that we've been able to do through it. Um, one, one quick example is Tony Corley and, and Greg Rochelle. They were, they're big leaders in the community and they both have their respective organizations that have been extremely impactful, but they had kind of a falling out back in the day, maybe 20 years ago now, and they hadn't talked to each other since then and then they were both part of this project and when we had our first screening for cast and crew of the full feature which is a really long time ago almost about eight months now or something <laughs> ago in the past they they kind of reconnected and they you know they said they shook each other's hands they they apologized to each other and now they're really really great friends all the way until there was a the competition that tony corley got an award at and greg rochelle actually walked tony corley to the stage to accept this award and so for us that was a very proud moment that to see that we could connect these two titans in the in our community that unfortunately had a problem but you know through the project they saw the greater the greater kind of vision and they came together so for me i think that has been really the most amazing part very cool and david yeah for me i would say the one thing would be healing you know it was healing for me and i think it was healing for the community and you know when we screen at the santa barbara international film festival we had a q a session and at the end of the Q&A session, this lady got up and she talked about, you know, her, her quote ended with healing. And what she said was that this movie is a revelation. You know, she said, I never knew about our history, about what it is to be a black surfer, what it is to be connected to the water. You know, she thanked us for opening the scope of this experience with the community. There's so much power in our pain, you know, um, and this was very healing and that's how she ended it. And to me, for me it was healing and to hear from someone else like that was very powerful. 
And I mean, my favorite part would be, you know, the spiritual section, because it is what brings us together. So that would be my answer. I love it. Uh, the next question is from Et Tree Hat J. This one's actually for David specifically. What is the toughest part about working on Super Bowl ads? And which was your favorite ad from this year's Super Bowl? Um, I'll have to give props to Amazon <laughs> because I was actually working on a project um, at the Den where Amazon was actually in there working on their stew. And the guy who was working on it was my classmate. And he did the dog commercial uh, for Amazon where the dog, you know, as the family left, rips the house apart, which I can relate to. And my dog, I have a dog called Duke, and he just Duke. rips everything apart. <laughs> uh, but you know, so to answer your question, it's about, you know, when you create a Super Bowl spot, you want it to be relatable. And I was able to relate to that story. So I would say the Amazon spot is my favorite. The hardest part about working on Super Bowl I mean, you're pitching ideas over and over. You go through, you know, 80, 90 ideas before one of yours is selected to go to a client. And then you're competing with another four or five groups. So to make it at the end, to produce a documentary, it's a grind. <laughs> it's a grind. <laughs> what about you, Bayan? Did you watch the Super Bowl? Did you have an ad that stood out for you? Um, honestly, I didn't watch any part of the Super Bowl. <laughs> I usually do. I'm not a huge football fan, but I, I love to catch this. It's a big kind of event just for humanity, I think. But um, this sure. one, we had our, our screening, our second screening at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival on Sunday at uh, 2.40. It started, and I think the Super Bowl started at 3.30. And so watch that. Of course, I had to attend our, our own screening. And then after the screening, I was we were hoping to just actually go down to the Ventura Surf Club. Jeff, my friend Jeff invited us, and we were going to just watch it there. But we, uh, we we got kind of really touched by a lot of the people that came up to us after the screening. And we just, you know, spent a lot of time talking to them, hearing their stories. And it was a really amazing experience. Couldn't really leave that to go and watch like half of the Super Bowl. And so especially after these people, you know, they they missed the whole Super Bowl to see our project. And so the least we could do is just stay and, you know, answer some questions and say hello, meet some really cool people. And uh, yeah, I, I actually, then I just I just kind of cut my losses and f met a new friend, had dinner with her and just like didn't didn't end up watching the Super Bowl. So no, don't have a favorite ad for you, but I'll, I'll uh, ask David later for, for what I should watch. <laughs> Well, I, I think that's fair. It sounds like you had a good Sunday anyway. And I'll, I'll give a, just an honorable mention shout out to the return of the uh, the E-Trade babies at the wedding and calling out the dude for owning a yes. mansion in the metaverse, but still living with his mom. I <laughs> yeah. No, I was going to say, awesome. Dan, my, my, uh, my cheating answer was going to be if there was a WSL ad in the Super Bowl, that was going to be my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the closest we've got in the past was the uh, Michelob Ultra Pure Gold, where Kelly was part of the ad for, uh, you know, point three seconds or that's whatever right, there we go that's right. there we go yeah oh they filmed that up in oxnard Prop actually i was oh, i really? helped, helped on the production for it nice. yeah yeah <laughs> i think they like made everyone sit out in, like the freezing water for eight hours for 0.3 seconds of him saying i drink beer or something like that. so so now 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 that we're here you know i know you said this is going to be casual and you mentioned kelly slater i'm going to plug in the one time that i met kelly slater was because I lived in Florida and he's from Florida. There was a competition down near Smyrna. I was very young and we were out, you know, it was a competition taking place. We're paddling on the right side and Kelly caught a wave and I was like right about to drop and I actually dropped on him <laughs> and kind of cut him off and I quickly pulled my board up, you know, dude. So he took off, dude, I, much respect to him. Didn't say much. He came back and said, like, we were very young, you know, uh, still young. Um, but, you know, he was very cool about it. He's like, dude, just try not to get into it. Like, I apologize. I mean, I knew better. Uh, so that was my moment with Kelly. Now that you brought up Kelly, since we're plugging all <laughs> kinds of names, might as well plug Kelly Slater's name. I'm all one, for it. I think, I think... Well, I think you bring up a, an amazing point in surfing too, which is just the accessibility factor to like the world's best surfers, right? Where 
it would be insane to like walk onto the court and try to shoot around LeBron before totally. he was warming up or to like hey, ask so Patrick Mahomes to throw me some button hooks or so something. But totally. Everywhere on the planet, the ocean is for everybody and you can paddle out and you can be next to Carissa Moore or Kelly Slater or, or whoever you like. And, and for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, it is, it is amazing in that, in a lot of ways. Um, a third question that we, we got from the Instagram community is from at right dot fam who asks, who or what is your biggest inspiration for your work? Uh, Bayan, we'll start with you on this one. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, I would say, you know, I think I biased myself by by just kind of shouting out Mikey February. But um, he is a huge inspiration for me personally. Like he, just the pro- for many, many reasons. One is just his surfing. Like his surfing, I think he's, you know, I think he's most people's favorite surfer. Like he's just one of, he's on another level as far as style and, as well as technique and so he's he's an amazing kind of inspiration as far as surfing but also when it comes to video projects he has this amazing kind of video series called uh, sonic souvenirs i'm sure you're familiar where he um you know goes around to different african nations and explores both the culture and the surfing and you know makes this kind of short documentary style video for youtube that vans puts on and um yeah i was really inspired i went to the premiere of his second episode in the ivory coast and that was a really, really amazing experience just watching that on the big screen with actually a lot of the members from our community. I, I did a really big effort to kind of spread the word to, within our community, posted it on the Black Dot Surfers Discord and just reached out to all the people I knew within Softly Surf School and Paddle for Peace. And really, really so many people from the community were at that event. David, unfortunately, could not make it for some reason or another. But, you know, everyone I knew, like Brick, Gage, um, you know, Saw and I, actually, I'm not sure. I think Saw missed it, but Sierra, Mar- Monica, just Nate, like so many people were, were there, Brandon Benjamin, so many people were there. And so for me to watch that with with some of my close friends and be, so everyone was just so impacted by this experience. And then we got to, you know, go back and talk to him a little bit, to just connect with each other, just talk about how we enjoyed it. And then I talked to the the DP on that project. I forget his name now, but he, he gave me some cool kind of advice, cool words. And I was just starting out on this project. And so that was a big inspiration for me, just what comes to mind, just Mikey February and his, uh, his kind of film work that he's put out has been really super inspirational for me very cool and, and david yeah it's hard to answer that question because there's so many people you know it's like my daughter is my muse my wife you know uh, you know i have so many mentors so many people that open doors for me and you know my family and my mom and if i have to pick one percent probably be my father you know he's uh he was he, he was the one that exposed me to advertising and design he used to work at a at an advertising shop in ethiopia and he was head of account and i just used to hang around him and that's when i got exposed into the arts you know i went to school we didn't have arts department but hanging out with him really exposed me to the idea of advertising and design and then just the the type of person he was, you know, he was a soldier, he fought in Korea, he was uh, part of the Ethiopian, you know, uh, Royal Guard, he was the Imperial Bodyguard of Haile Selassie, you know, so much history within him that's been passed to us. And in many ways, I credit him for the job that I have, you know, advertising and design. And also, you know, I work for a company called InOcean USA, which is owned by Koreans, you know, having your father fought for Korea, for freedom, and then working for them for about 11 years now, you know? So I give a lot of credits to my father just for being who he was. Very cool. And thank you to everyone that wrote in questions that at the lineup pod, if we didn't get to your question, uh, we will try to do it on social media. So keep the comments and questions coming in. Uh, we're now at the final segment of the podcast. It's time for the lightning round. Oh no. These are 10 questions for you to answer as quickly as you can. Uh, for the purposes of this, um, I think uh, each question I'll ask, and then David, you answer, and then Bayan, you answer, and then I'll move on to the next question. Sounds so, good. first question is if you can only have one surfboard setup for the rest of your life, a single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad, bonzer, or finless, 
Which would you choose, David? Single fan. Single fan. Oh, uh, I think single fan as well, probably. Okay. Uh, next one: coffee or tea? Tea. Tea, boon, as we call it in our East African culture. Great. Uh, next one: burrito or pizza? Ooh, burrito. I'm going burrito for sure. Last book you read? Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> I read so many books. You know, I just actually read about the Portuguese um, travel into Africa. Um, it's uh, shoot, I, I don't remember the the title of the book, but I was just that was the last book that I read. Uh, you got me on a spot. It'll go back to Bayan, but it's about you know the first travel into Africa through Portuguese and. Henry the Traveler. Uh, it, was, it was great. It was a great book. I don't remember the title. Sorry, guys. Apology. No, no worries. No worries. My favorite. My last book that I read is uh, "Never Split the Difference" by Chris Voss. It's a great kind of negotiation book. Very cool. Uh, next question for David: What is one wave you never have to go back to? One wave you never have to go back to. Uh, what do you mean by that? Just maybe one that you prefer not to surf again. Oh, uh, like a spot, a surf spot, or yeah, yeah, oh, like a surf, yeah, spot. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> probably going back to St. Augustine, man. Going back to St. Augustine. <laughs> I, I want to go back now with you, I'm, David. No, now that I'm back in California, it would go back to Holiday Inn spot. It was a horrible place to surf. <laughs> Yeah, no, my uh, my my wave that I wouldn't I, I don't have to go back to is kind of a joking answer, but El Porto is, is something that I always joke <laughs> with my friends. It's like the worst wave in the world, but somehow I'm always surfing it, and so yeah, that's my <laughs> answer. <laughs> Good answer. All right, well, uh, we'll we'll switch it up here. If you only get to surf one wave for the rest of your life, and you can dreamcast it, it could be any conditions. It could be crowded. It could be empty. Whatever you like, David. What is the one wave that you would want to surf for the rest of your life? I would have to say Waikiki. That's a good answer. Um, I'm going to have to go first point Malibu for sure. No crowd. Head high. That's that's the dream. Chris Dennis, actually, he, he made a nickname for me. I visited him in Trinidad and I loved the longboard kind of clean waves. I was always looking for those and he's looking for like crazy, crazy waves. <laughs> and he, he would call me first point. And so I got I to gotta go with the first point. Malibu first point. <laughs> good answer. Uh, best surf film ever, David. Wait in the water. <laughs> yeah, no. I'm going wow. wait in the water for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> no question. It's got to be up there. No question. I love it. I love it. Um, David, best person to share a lineup with? I would have to say my brother Bayan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, man. If, You're on the spot, man. Yeah, if I'm being honest, that was not my first answer, David. So <laughs> I really like uh, I really like surfing with uh, Julian Williams. He's a kid from Hawaii, part of our documentary. He grew up on the North Shore in Wailua, yep. and he's an amazing surfer. And I just learned so much kind of surfing with him, especially on the shortboard side of things. Even though he's an amazing longboarder, he, uh, he's, a, he's just, I learned so much from him kind of shortboarding. And so, yeah, I love surfing with him. All right, love Dave, it. I'm uh, gonna I'm gonna have to take we'll go. that back <laughs> because <laughs> I'm gonna say my son. Forget you, but you know, I'm just kidding. It's okay. It's okay. No, no, no I'm love messing love. with you. <laughs> uh, uh, next question, David. Yes. Uh, worst person to share a lineup with? Ooh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Worst person. I, I don't, man. I love everyone. You know, I don't have this negative vibe when I get out in the water. It's a hard question. I really don't. I don't. I love surfing with everyone. David, you should have said me. You should have said you hate surfing with me. That would have been no. a great I, I felt like you're going <laughs> to no. tag him back. I'm not going to tag you, you back. Picture. I love you, man. <laughs> I love you. Yeah. Well, my, my worst person is, is David. No, no, I'm joking. But um, I, would say, um, I would say Saw Philly Maturi, that my co-founder at Safi Surf School. He, I mean, he's an amazing surfer. He's my brother. But at the end of the day, he's just such a good surfer that every time I surf with him, he's always down the line for me. And he's always in perfect position. And I just can never get a wave. Like, I remember so many times when we're surfing lowers or 
your churches. I'm just like, oh, I can't. I'm in the perfect spot. I'm looking. I'm like, well, how is this guy 10 feet down the line? And he's just in a perfect spot. <laughs> and so just like Julian Williams, they're just too good for me to surf with. So I got to jokingly say that. I know how that is. I mean, I've been doing, I've been at the ASPW cell for 18 years now. And my friends were like, you must get the best waves. I'm like, I surf with <laughs> the best surfers on the planet. I get nothing. Like, exactly. Cool. exactly. <laughs> and, um, last question for both of you. Start with David. Uh, it was more of a, a prompt. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by meditating. Mm. Ben? Uh, surfing tomorrow morning. I love it. Well, before we go, guys, I, I did want to check in. So, so we've got Wade in the Water that's taking up a huge amount of your time. What other kind of projects are you going to be working on this year, just in your own respective lives? Uh, I'll start with you, David. Yeah. So, you know, a work. I have, to, I have a nine to five. So, looking forward to working with my colleagues at an ocean, of course. And then, in terms of passion project, I really want to see where this is going to go putting all my effort in, you know, finding a distributor and trying to reach, you know, worldwide audience. And, you know, since my, our goal has been to inspire the next generation of black surfers and that's worldwide. So really that'll be the next year will be putting a lot of effort into that. Very cool. And Bayan, you mentioned, you mentioned the Paddle for Peace organization, you, a little bit more about that and anything else you got going on for 2023. Yeah, totally. So I think 2023, of course, Safi Surf School, that's kind of core for me. That's huge, huge focus. Um, and then we got a great day in the Stoke quickly. I want to mention as well as a beautiful kind of BIPOC run, right, right. kind of big surfing competition in Huntington Beach. It's happening in September, the second annual event. So I'm, I'm stoked to be working on that as well um, after the first one was a big success. And then, yeah, Paddle for Peace is just a really amazing kind of nonprofit organization that I sit on the chair of, I'm a, or sorry, on the board of. I'm a vice chair with, with Rissa. She's the executive director that I, I mentioned. And so she, she that that org is just uh, really, really based out of San Diego. Uh, we do we do a big kind of Juneteenth event every every year. And we bring together all the organizations from, you know, Southern California, mostly and some from Northern California. And we just have a big day where we teach a bunch of people how to surf. And we have so many amazing volunteers that sign up. And I think last year we had, I think, north of 50 volunteers that signed up and even more kind of surf like students just coming to learn. And then we gave away like all kinds of prizes, wave storms, Patagonia wetsuits and skateboards and all kinds of things. And so, yeah, that, that event and that kind of organization is really going to be a big focus for me kind of going forward. We do a yearly retreat down to Mexico, Baja, Mexico, where we go to an orphanage and we kind of give back a little bit as well. And also it's a bit of a surf trip. So that's a good time. Um, and then we just have a couple, a few more kind of events throughout the year. But uh, yeah, we just want a big grant to, to kind of fund some of those events. So we're really excited about that and just kind of strategizing about how we're going to actually use that in, in the most efficient way possible. So yeah, I would say that that's going to be a big focus. And just quickly, that organization is not only a surf instruction organization, but a big focus of that one is also to bring more people of color into the nonprofit leadership space, into the organization leadership space, because a lot of times it's very hard for people in the community to connect with people that they don't relate with. They don't, they don't look like them. They don't have any personal relationships, any personal connections with them. And so a big focus for us is really to put people in the community on a stage to be able to give back to the community kind of for you, by you. And so that's that, that event. Thank you for asking about that. That would be a kind of a big focus for me kind of going forward. Well, that's awesome. Well, David Bayan, thank you so much for coming on the lineup and, and sharing your time and experience with me. Um, everyone out there is listening to this. Be sure to catch Wade in the Water, a journey into black surfing and aquatic culture. It is going to be premiering tomorrow, Wednesday, February 22nd at Patagonia in Santa Monica, supported by Surfrider LA at 6.30 p.m. It's also going to be showing on Thursday, February 23rd at the University of San Diego at 6 p.m. The link is in the description for more details for this episode. Again, guys, thank you so much for coming on. It, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Same, thank, thank you, you thank so you. much to everyone. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to quickly say thank thank you, Dave. It's been really great talking to you. But um, Tim Greenberg, really want to give flowers to him. Emily Valls, Emily Hines, thank you guys so much. 
Um, Sharon Schaefer, thank you for making the whole connection, making it possible. And thank you to the WSL for not only having us on this podcast, but really, you know, actually financially sponsoring our project. Very few kind of organizations have been able to help us in that way. So that's something we're really appreciative of. And yeah, we'd love to kind of develop this relationship. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, guys.